another tool to pay their respects to this work of Mazar Choi cannot understand what people find so admirable in such a painting. God should never be represented as a mere man. Only that brash young artist would allow himself such liberties. Masaccio's freedom is the freedom of mankind, for it is by our actions that we preserve our very autonomy. Unless you understand this, the painting loses all its meaning. No, Chiriaco. That is not a full enough explanation of this holy trinity. In addition to his astounding visual expressiveness, Masaccio's art is the result of geometric laws which he has applied to the new science of perspective and no painter or architect may ever again be free of these rules. Perspective, you say, what does that matter? Where is the magnificence of Christ? All of our great painters were good religious men who knew that God is immense and infinite, but in this picture, Christ has the body of a man, and that leaves little to the imagination. Masaccio's painting is alarming. If viewed through the taboos and timidities of tradition, Tradition has always used the dogma of the church to emphasize human frailty. Masaccio, instead, took inspiration from his hearty observations of real life. He observes man as the center of human development, and throughout he combines his knowledge of the laws of geometry with an artistic performance. Your reasoning is sound in part. I believe in this work, Masaccio, wish to portray the spiritual way after the death of man. First, it carries us to Christ, that is, to man-God. And then, further on, to God, the Father, who is the opposite of, of death. Then why did he give Christ a man's body? But Christ came to us as a man. No doubt religious faith has its just value. But the artist must start from his own reality, a human reality. Masaccio rightly gave man his exact dimension, and he did well to give Christ so human a body. What's important to me in this painting is that art and knowledge are, are interwoven. There can be no fine art today unless it is, as well, fine science. Master Alberti. You were right, Toscanelli. This text is overburdened by imagination, and the calculations do not seem precise. Yet the Arabs remain the world's greatest mathematicians. I've reworked the calculations listed here. Mine are now more accurate. Come and see my map. I've consulted every known Arab text. I've heard innumerable travelers and merchants who have crossed Africa and Asia. Expert navigators who have sailed their ships to the very columns of Hercules. And I've calculated that the circumference of the Earth is 28,000 miles. Your calculations are accurate. Your hypothesis is perfection. Not yet. I have still to complete it. But I know this plan can indicate to any navigator new diverse routes to faraway countries. Not only does our Toscanelli design naval maps, he also traces the course of the stars. Have you seen this, Master Alberti? Cardinal Niccolò da Cusano exaggerates. Look, he's trying to trace and predict the course of a comet. This one, of 1433. According to Toscanelli, we will be able to see the same comet again in 1445. I've integrated some old Egyptian principles of astrology in my calculations. Every time I visit our friend Toscanelli, one thought becomes more and more clear. The universe is a pluralistic unity. It's difficult for us to understand, but though the universe is composed of a thousand parts, 
They are brought back to unity by God who lives in them. And in this unity, opposites coincide. Heat and cold, light and shadow, high and low. We think of these as contradictions, but they coexist in the universe and are rational, for in the universe, as in God, opposites are harmonious, at one and the same time containing the reason for their own being and for their opposites. Truth is in the one which is absolute, singular, and infinite. But human knowledge is relative, multiple, limited. It is only an approximation, and every science is merely a conjecture. When one can admit that God and the universe are unknowable, the only remaining path is that of the unknowing sage and his constant, organic study of conjecture. Only in God can one realize the summit of knowledge, for his infinite simplicity contains within itself the multiplicity of things. He is in everything the eternal form which bestows every being with its own nature. The scholastic man would object, if God is the eternal form of all things, then he lives in man as in all things. Then God cannot be distinguished from man. Consequently, he cannot be an absolute and eternal being. To affirm this is to say God is not God, a heresy. God is simple and eternal unity, intelligence and mysterious perfection. He is all, not a part. He is the cause of all. He is present in everything in his universe. Man, in his own way, is also a god, but not in absolute terms. Man is a microcosm, and the world lives in him. The human god is a unity of power and act, separate facts of reality, according to Aristotle and the scholastic mind, which perfectly coincide. I am convinced that just as when our eyes look through a red glass and see everything as red, the human mind's eye cannot look at God except through the mind of man. Therefore, man can only see a God who conforms to human limits. If a lion were to give God a face, he would give him the face of a lion. An ox would give him the face of an ox. An eagle, an eagle's head. I say that the face of God must be truly admirable and if each to conceive of it must think of himself, the man as male, the old man as old. All creatures may look at God in their own image. But he is one, alone, and above all others. All that you say is fascinating, yet also obscure and difficult to comprehend. In you, both clarity and obscurity touch. As you say, they are opposites which coincide. To better understand, my discussion, read the text which your friend Nicolai certainly has in his library. One, by Plotinus. My greatest delight is in reading. I've read your book, Very Learned Ignorance, and I was fascinated. However, now that the councils of Basel and Ferrara are to be transferred to Florence, it is ever more difficult for me to take a refuge in the library of some friend. However, I'll try to do so. 
Your subtle discourse may perhaps take us far from the clarity of Aristotelian logic into the cloudy world of dreams. <laughs>